Welcome back to the pre-learning module for Ship Safety Course Part 2B. This module, Part 2B, covers the remaining chapters of SOLAS, that is, chapters 4 to 14, indicated in red. SOLAS Chapter 4 is about radio communications. GMDSS stands for Global Maritime Distress and Safety System. It was introduced in the 1988 Amendments of SOLAS, which came into force on 1st February 1992, with the transitional grace period until 1st February 1999. GMDSS replaced the traditional type of radio equipment that used Morse code. Unless expressly provided otherwise, this chapter applies to all passenger and cargo ships of 300 gross tonnage and upwards engaged on international voyages. The slide introduces the basic concept of GMDSS. At first, search and rescue operation of ship-to-shore-based stations. This ship is in distress. The distress alert is transmitted by MFHFDSC or VHFDSC to the coast radio station. And this information is transferred to the Rescue Coordination Centre, RCC, and through the coast radio station to the rescue ship. At the same time, a distress alert is also transmitted by emergency position indicating radio beacon, EPIRB, or Inmarsat SES, the satellite systems. The distress information is transferred to a local user terminal, or Coast Earth Station through RCC, and through the coast radio station to the rescue ship. Next one is the operation ship-to-ship -ship based station. The distress alert is transmitted by MFHF or VHF DSC to ships in the area. A ship, on receiving one of these signals, goes to rescue the distressed ship. These functions are provided under functional requirements in Regulation 4. The slide provides the definition of sea area. Sea area A1 is the area within the range of VHF coast station with continuous DSC alerting available, usually at a range of about 20 miles from the coast. Sea area A2 is the area beyond sea area A1, but within the range of MF coast stations with continuous DSC alerting available, usually at a range of about 100 miles from coast. Sea Area A3 is located beyond Sea Area A2, but within the coverage of the geostationary Inmarsat satellite. Sea Area A4 is the area further beyond A3. Geographically, they are located at the northern and southern polar regions. As shown in the previous slide introducing the basic concept of GMDSS, Regulation 4 enumerates the functional requirements of GMDSS. Every ship, while at sea, shall have these capabilities. Regulation 6 is radio installations. Every ship shall be provided with radio installations as appropriate for individual service areas. The table summarises the installation requirements. Regulation 6.2.4 specifies that every radio installation must be provided with electrical lighting, independent of the main and emergency sources of electric power. Regulation 7 prescribes the minimum requirements for radio equipment. Every ship shall be provided with radio equipment as follows. 1. A VHF radio telephone with channels 6, 13 and 16. 2. Digital selective calling, DSC and DSC watch receiver, the device making and receiving distress signals. 3. Search and Rescue Locating Device, SART, a device to facilitate easy location of survival crafts in distress. Ships shall be provided with either 9 GHz Search and Rescue Transponder or AIS SART, as provided by Regulation 6.2.2 of Chapter 3 in SOLAS. 4. Navtex Receiver, a device capable of automatically receiving International Marine Safety Information Service broadcast. 5. EGC receiver, the high-frequency direct printing telegraphy receiver. 6. 406 MHz emergency position indicating radio beacon, a free-floating type radio buoy. It will automatically transmit distress signal when the ship sinks. Additionally, for passenger ships, a two-way on-scene radio communication device using aeronautical frequencies shall be provided. Regulation 13 is sources of energy. 1. 
There shall be available at all times a supply of electrical energy sufficient to operate the radio installations and to charge any batteries used as part of a reserve source of energy for the radio installations. 2. A reserve source is usually batteries, which shall be provided on every ship to supply power to radio installations in the event of failure of the ship's main and emergency sources. 3. The reserve source or sources of energy shall be independent of the propelling power of the ship and the ship's electrical system. Regulation 15 provides maintenance requirements. The administration shall ensure to provide the availability of the functional requirements. There are three methods to ensure the availability of functional requirements. Duplication of equipment, shore-based maintenance, at sea electronic maintenance. The ships for sea areas A1 and A2 shall apply at least one method. The ships for sea areas A3 and A4 shall apply at least two methods. The shore-based maintenance and the duplication of equipment in the combination are usually adopted by merchant ships. The IMO Resolution A702-17 details its guidelines. Solus Chapter 5 – Safety of Navigation Regulation 1 – Application the regulations of this chapter shall apply to all ships on all voyages, except certain ships, such as warships. However, the administration shall determine to what extent the provisions of regulations 15 to 28 do not apply to the following categories of ships. Ships below 150 gross tonnage engaged on any voyages. Ships below 500 gross tonnage not engaged on international voyages and fishing vessels. Regulations 4 to 14 enumerate the duties of contracting governments, which contribute to the safety of ships sailing. Regulation 14 is ships manning. The contracting governments ensure that its national ships shall be sufficiently and efficiently manned. Every ship to which Chapter 1 applies shall be provided with minimum safe manning document issued by the administration. The document shall be issued in accordance with the principles of minimum safe manning adopted by IMO Resolution A1047-27. If a ship is manned in accordance with a safe manning document, the Port State Control Officer should accept that the ship is safely manned unless the document has clearly been issued without adhering to its principles. Working language shall be established and recorded in the ship's logbook. On ships to which Chapter 1 applies, English shall be used on the bridge as the working language for bridge-to-bridge -bridge and bridge-to-shore safety communications, unless a common language other than English is spoken. Regulation 19 provides carriage requirements for shipborne navigational systems and equipment. Ships shall be fitted with these systems and equipment in accordance with its type, gross tonnage and the year of build. Ships constructed on or after 1st July 2002 shall be fitted with navigational systems and equipment as mentioned in paragraphs 2.1 to 2.9. Ships constructed before 1st July 2002 shall be fitted with navigational systems and equipment as required by Solus 1974 in force prior to 1st July 2002. This slide shows the navigational systems and equipment listed on the cargo ship safety equipment certificate. Regulation 19 provides carriage requirements for shipborne navigational systems and equipment. Ships shall be provided with these systems and equipment in accordance with its type, gross tonnage and the year of build as required by the provisions. Those indicated in red will be explained in the following slides. First one is standard magnetic compass. The number on the title of the slide, 1.1, is the number associated with the Form E of Cargo Ship Safety Equipment Certificate shown in the previous slide. All ships, irrespective of size, shall be provided with a standard magnetic compass that is independent of any power supply and properly adjusted to determine the ship's heading and is displayed at the steering position. Gyro compass. All ships of 500 gross tonnage and upward shall be provided with a gyro compass. Its purpose is to determine and display ship's heading and is clearly readable by helmsman and transmits heading information to radar, automatic identification system, AIS, and automatic tracking aid, ATA. The definition of nautical chart or nautical publication is provided in Regulation 2.2. It is a special purpose map or book issued officially by Authorised Hydrographic Office. They are designed to meet the requirements of marine navigation. 
All ships shall have nautical charts and nautical publications to plan and display the ship's route for the intended voyage, and to plot and monitor positions throughout the voyage. Alternatively, an electronic chart display and information system, ECDIS, may also be used instead of nautical charts if it fulfills the requirements. Nautical charts and nautical publications shall have accurate scale and maintained up to date. The slide shows the carriage requirements of ECDIS. It was introduced on 1st July 2012, with a transitional period of six years. Hence, all passenger ships of 500 gross tonnage and upwards, and cargo ships of 10,000 gross tonnage and upwards which are engaged on international voyages, shall be provided with ECDIS. The slide shows the backup arrangements for ECDIS and nautical publication. If the functions of nautical charts and nautical publication is partly or fully fulfilled by electronic means, a backup arrangement is required. Such as duplication of ECDIS or paper charts is provided as a backup system. All ships, irrespective of size, shall have a receiver for a Global Navigation Satellite System, GNSS, to establish and update the ship's position by automatic means throughout the intended voyage. GPS is one of the systems. 9 GHz radar. All ships of 300 gross tonnage and upwards, and passenger ships irrespective of size, shall be fitted with a 9 GHz radar to determine and display the range and bearing of search and rescue transponders, SART, and of other surface craft, obstructions, buoys, shorelines and navigational marks to assist in navigation and in collision avoidance. The photo on the right shows how a signal from the SART is detected and indicated on the radar display. Automatic Identification System AIS All ships of 300 gross tonnage and upward engaged on international voyage shall be provided with AIS. AIS automatically receives information from other ships, such as the name, position, destination and estimated time of arrival, and displays them on the screen. AIS SART information can also be obtained to indicate the range and distance of the SART. AIS shall be operational at all times, except in certain cases in accordance with international agreement. This is an image of the Long Range Identification and Tracking, LRIT, system. The purpose of the system is to collect information regarding ships' movement and is shared among the concerned bodies relating to the safety and security of the ships. The ship automatically transmits the LRIT data every six hours, which includes the ship's ID, position, date and time of the position provided. A Satellite of Communication Service Provider, CSP, receives and transfers the information to other CSP on shore and to data centre. The data will be shared by the bodies of Flag State and Coastal State, which are responsible for the safety and security of ships. Voyage Date Recorder, VDR, and Simplified Voyage Date Recorder, SVDR. These devices are designed to record the date to assist in casualty investigations. Passenger ships and cargo ships of 3,000 gross tonnage and upward, constructed on or after 1st July 2002, shall be fitted with VDR. For cargo ships of 3,000 gross tonnage and upward, constructed before 1st July 2002, SVDR may be fitted. The table shows the information to be recorded by VDR and SVDR. The slide shows Bridge Navigational Watch Alarm System, BNWAS. Passenger ships and cargo ships of 150 gross tonnage and upwards shall be fitted with BNWAS. The purpose of BNWAS is to monitor bridge activity and detect operator disability which could lead to marine accidents. The system monitors the awareness of Officer of the Watch, OOW, and automatically alerts the master or another qualified OOW if the OOW becomes incapable of performing his or her duties. The device is designed to monitor the conditions of the navigational equipment indicated in the slide, which reflects the bridge activities. Regulation 22 is Navigation Bridge Visibility. The slide shows the view of the sea surface from the conning position. There are other requirements for the visibility, but this is one of the most important ones. It shall not be obscured by more than two ship length, or 500 metres, whichever is less, forward of the bow to 10 degrees on either side under all conditions of draft, trim and deck cargo. The requirements are applicable not only to the ship's structure, but also to cargo such as the containers stowed on upper deck. Regulation 23 is pilot transfer arrangements. 
Several accidents were reported during the embarkation and disembarkation of pilots. The regulations require the suitable equipment and safe operations by crew. The slide shows a leaflet prepared by International Maritime Pilot Association. Ships engaged on voyages which employ pilots shall be provided with pilot transfer arrangements. From the left in the leaflet, it shows a pilot ladder rigged with two-man ropes for facilitating embarkation and disembarkation operation. Next illustration is a combination arrangement with accommodation ladder. Whenever the distance from the surface of the water to the point of access to the ship is more than 9 metres, an accommodation ladder shall be prepared in conjunction with the pilot ladder. The other illustrations show the operational arrangement. Please note that the use of mechanical hoist is no longer permitted. The slide shows the structure of Chapter 6, Carriage of Cargoes and Oil Fuels. Let us examine some of the important provisions. Part A, General Provisions. Regulation 1 is application. Unless expressly provided otherwise, this chapter applies to the carriage of cargoes, except liquids in bulk, gases in bulk, and those aspects of carriage covered by other chapters, which, owing to their particular hazards to ships or persons on board, may require special precautions in all ships to which the present regulations apply and in cargo ships of less than 500 tonnes gross tonnage. Regulation 1-1 is definitions. IMSBC code means the International Maritime Solid Bulk Cargoes Code. The code is mandatory for the carriage of solid cargo other than grains in bulk. The code categorises solid cargo into three groups, namely Group A, cargoes which may liquefy, Group B, chemically hazardous cargoes, and Group C, other cargoes. The requirements are provided for the cargo equipment and operational matters. Further explanations on this code will be provided in the classroom lecture. Regulation 2 is cargo information. The shipper shall provide the master with the cargo information sufficiently in advance of loading. The cargo properties to be included in the information are provided. Regulation 3 is oxygen analysis and gas detection equipment. An appropriate instrument for measuring the concentration of gas or oxygen in the air shall be provided. Regulation 4 is about the use of pesticides in ships. Appropriate precautions shall be taken regarding the use of pesticides in ships, particularly for fumigation purposes to remove rats, harmful insects, bacteria, etc. Regulation 5 is stowage and securing. The cargo securing manual approved by administration or recognised organisations, RO, shall be provided. Regulation 5-1 is the requirement for material safety data sheets. Ships carrying oil or oil fuel shall be provided with material safety data sheets prior to loading cargo or bunkering of oil fuel. The provision is introduced for the safety of the crew. Part B. Special provisions for bulk cargoes other than grain. This part provides special operational requirements for the cargo operation of bulk cargoes other than grain, such as iron ore, coal and so on. Part C. Carriage of grain. The term grain includes wheat, maize, corn, oats, rye, barley, rice, pulses, seeds and processed forms thereof whose behaviour is similar to that of grain in its natural state. International Grain Code means international code for the safe carriage of grain in bulk adopted by the Resolution MSC 2359th. The code provides additional requirements when ships carry grain in bulk. The code will be explained in detail in the classroom lecture. Chapter 7 relates to the carriage of dangerous goods. The slide shows the structure of Chapter 7. Part A is carriage of dangerous goods in packaged form. IMDG code means the International Maritime Dangerous Goods Code adopted by the resolution MSC 12275th, which is the mandatory code for the carriage of dangerous goods in packaged form. Part A1 is carriage of dangerous goods in solid form in bulk. The carriage of dangerous goods in solid form in bulk shall be in compliance with the relevant provisions of the IMSBC code as defined in Regulation 1-1 of Chapter 6. Part B is construction and equipment of ships carrying dangerous liquid chemicals in bulk. International Bulk Chemical Code, IBC Code, is briefly explained in the following slides. Part C is construction and equipment of ships carrying liquefied gases in bulk. 
International Gas Carrier Code, IGC Code, is briefly explained in the following slides. Part D. Special Requirements for the Carriage of Packaged Irradiated Nuclear Fuel, Plutonium and High-Level Radioactive Wastes on Board Ships. INF Code stands for International Nuclear Fuel Code, which means the International Code for the Safe Carriage of Packaged Irradiated Nuclear Fuel, Plutonium and High-Level Radioactive Wastes on Board Ships adopted by the Maritime Safety Committee of the Organisation by Resolution MSC 8871. All ships other than warships or government-operated ships, as provided in Regulation 15.2, shall follow the requirements of INF code for the carriage of INF cargo. The slide shows the summary of applicable regulations or codes in Chapter 6 and 7 regarding carriage of cargo. It is determined by the nature of the cargoes and the form of the carriage, such as in bulk or not in bulk. This slide is about International Bulk Chemical Code. Chemical tanker means a cargo ship constructed or adapted and used for the carriage in bulk of any liquid product listed in Chapter 17 of IBC Code. The purpose of this code is to provide an international standard for the safe carriage of dangerous chemicals and noxious liquid substances listed in Chapter 17 of the Code. The code prescribes the construction standards of ships and the equipment they shall carry to minimise risk to the ship, its crew and the environment, considering the nature of the products. International Certificate of Fitness for the Carriage of Dangerous Chemicals in Bulk is issued after verifying that the ship complies with all the requirements of IBC code at initial survey. The slide shows the table of Chapter 17 of IBC Code, which lists the chemicals and their carriage requirements according to the IBC Code. The slide shows some types of gas carriers. The slide is about International Gas Carrier Code. Gas carrier means a cargo ship constructed or adapted and used for the carriage in bulk of any liquefied gas or other products listed in Chapter 19 of the International Gas Carrier Code. The purpose of this code is to provide an international standard for the safe carriage of the gas or other products listed in Chapter 19 of the Code. The code prescribes the construction standards of ships and the equipment they shall carry to minimise the risk to the ship, its crew and the environment, taking into consideration the nature of the products as well. International Certificate of Fitness for the Carriage of Liquefied Gases in Bulk is issued after verifying that the ship complies with all the requirements of IGC code at initial survey. SOLAS Chapter 9 is Management for the Safe Operation of Ships This chapter was newly added to enhance the management for safe operation of shipping by introducing the International Safety Management Code, ISM Code, which came into force on 1st July 1998. The purpose of the code is to provide an international standard for the safe management and operation of ships and for pollution prevention. In this section, a brief introduction of ISM Code is provided as follows. Background Objectives of ISM Code Safety Management System Certifications, Conducting Audits and Issuing Statutory Certificates The slide shows instances of serious marine casualties and accidents caused by human errors, which necessitated the introduction of ISM code. The first one is Herald of Free Enterprise. The ship was a modern row-row passenger vehicle ferry employed in Dover Strait. The ship left the port without her bow door closed, because the assistant boatswain, in charge of the duty, forgot to close it. As the ship increased its speed after clearing the breakwaters, the bow waves began to rush into her vehicle space. The flood of water through the bow door quickly caused the vessel to become unstable, and she capsized just outside of the port, killing 193 passengers and crew on board. The second one was Exxon Valdez. It occurred on 24th March 1989. The ship was an oil tanker. She loaded crude oil and had begun the navigation for discharging port in Prince William Sound, Alaska. The third mate was at the navigation bridge, who failed to properly manoeuvre the ship, possibly due to fatigue or excessive workload after the loading cargo operation. The ship got aground and spilled more than 11 million gallons of crude oil, which caused serious oil pollution and killed plenty of sea mammals. Data show that about 80% of the accidents were caused by human error. As the main focus of the IMO, 
is to improve the technical standards for ships' equipment and constructions, the necessity for regulating the management of operational matter arose. It led to the introduction of the ISM Code, which aims to enhance the shipboard and shore-based safety management system. Objective of ISM Code The main objectives of the Code are to ensure safety at sea, prevention of human injury or loss of life, and avoidance of damage to the environment. In order to achieve these, the company responsible for the ship's management should 1. Ensure safe practices in ship operation and a safe working environment. 2. Assess all identified risks to its ships, personnel and the environment and establish appropriate safeguards. And 3. Continuously improve safety management skills of personnel ashore and aboard ships, including preparing for emergencies related both to safety and environmental protection. The company should develop and implement a safety management system, SMS, to ensure 1. Compliance with mandatory rules and regulations and 2. That applicable codes, guidelines and standards recommended by the organisation, administrations, classification societies and maritime industry organisations are taken into account. The slide shows the functional requirements for a safety management system. Every company should develop, implement and maintain a safety management system which includes the following functional requirements. Point 1. A safety and environmental protection policy. Point 2. Instructions and procedures to ensure safe operation of ships and protection of the environment in compliance with relevant international and flag state legislation. Point 3. Defined levels of authority and lines of communication between and amongst shore and shipboard personnel. Point 4. Procedures for reporting accidents and non-conformities with the provisions of this code. Point 5. Procedures to prepare for and respond to emergency situations. And Point 6. Procedures for internal audits and management reviews. In other words, the company should assess all identified risks to the ships, personnel and the environment and develop the manuals which include the above functions and implement them. This slide is about the audits and certifications for company. An initial audit shall be conducted for the verification of compliance to the company, which is newly in a scope of application and issue interim document of compliance, DOC, if the company is suitably prepared for it. Within the next 12 months, an audit is conducted to verify that the ship's SMS is properly implemented. Then a DOC is officially issued, which identifies the type of ships that the company is capable to operate. The DOC is valid for five years, and an annual audit is conducted every year for verification. Audits and certifications for ship Initial audit of the ship shall be conducted for the verification of compliance, following which an Interim Safety Management Certificate, SMC, is issued if the company and ship are suitably prepared. Within the next six months, an audit is conducted to verify that the ship's SMS is properly implemented. Then an SMC is officially issued, which indicates the company and type of ship. The SMC is valid for five years if annual audit is conducted every year for the verification. The ship shall be provided with a copy of DOC of the company. If the DOC of the company is invalid for some reason, the ship is not permitted to operate under the company. The slide shows the image of implementation for ISM code. 1. Flag State or Recognised Organisation, RO, conducts an audit of the management company and issues a DOC after verifying suitable development and implementation of SMS. 2. Then, Flag State conducts an audit of the ship and issues an SMC after verifying suitable implementation of SMS. 3. Port States visit the ship to conduct PSC inspections, occasionally to check its condition. When major non-conformity is detected, the Flag State, or RO, is informed by the Port State. The ship is detained until the PSC officer confirms that the major non-conformity is rectified. Chapter 11.1 is Special Measures to Enhance Maritime Safety. Regulation 1 is for Authorization of Recognised Organisations, RO. Regulation 6 of Chapter 1 of this Convention provides that the Administration may entrust the inspections and surveys to organisations recognised by it. 
However, the administration shall have full responsibility for the performance. The procedures and qualitative requirements for the recognised organisations are provided in this regulation, which came into force on 1st January 2015. Prior to this, there was no qualitative requirements for RO, hence it all depended on the decision of the administration. Following the introduction of qualitative requirements, certain ROs which did not suitably discharge their survey and certification duties were identified. However, after the introduction of RO code, the situation has improved with regard to the performance of Port State Control and IMO Member State Audit Scheme. Regulation 2 is Enhanced Survey Bulk carriers and oil tankers, as defined in this regulation, shall be subject to an enhanced survey programme in accordance with ESP code. Because of heavy deteriorations and poor maintenance of the hull, numerous casualties occurred on these type of ships. Hence, the special survey programme was introduced for these type of ships, which include close-up surveys on hull plates and construction members, such as regular measurement of their thickness. The 2011 ESP code came into force on 1st January 2014. SOLAS Chapter 11-2 is Special Measures to Enhance Maritime Security Background Following the terrorist attack on 11 September 2001 in the USA and the bombing of the French oil tanker Limburg on 6 October 2002 in the Gulf of Aden, IMO swiftly introduced protective measures against terrorist attacks on ships and port facilities. The amendments of SOLAS were adopted in December 2002 and came into force on 1 July 2004. The Chapter 11-2 was newly added to identify the responsibilities of the governments, shipping companies, shipboard personnel and port facility personnel in formulating the International Framework for Protective Measures. The International Ship and Port Facility Security ISPS code was introduced as a mandatory code aimed to ensure that the highest possible standards of security are implemented on ships and port facilities. Objectives of ISPS Code The main objectives of this code are 1. To establish an international framework involving cooperation between governments, the shipping and port industries to detect security threats and take preventive measures against security incidents affecting ships or port facilities used in international trade. 2. To establish the respective roles and responsibilities of the contracting governments, government agencies, local administrations and the shipping and port industries at the national and international level for ensuring maritime security. 3. To ensure the early and efficient collection and exchange of security-related information. 3. Outlines of ISPS Code Administration shall set security levels and ensure the provision of security-level information to ships entitled to fly their flag, port facilities within the territory, and ships prior to entering a port or whilst in a port. Each ship is required to carry a Ship Security Plan, SSP, which is developed by Security Risk Assessment and approved by the Administration for addressing the protective measures against security risks. A ship security officer, accountable to the master, is designated by the company as responsible for the security of the ships, including the implementation of SSP for liaison with company security officer and port facility security officer. The International Ship Security Certificate is issued after the verification of compliance by the administration or security recognised organisation. The slide shows the implementation mechanism of ISPS code. 1. The administration of the flag state is responsible for setting and changing the security level and informing about it to ships, companies, port facilities and other stakeholders. The administration is also responsible for the approval of Ship Security Plan, SSP, and Port Facility Security Plan, PFSP. The administration conducts audits of the ship and the company and issues the International Ship Security Certificate, ISSC, after verifying that the ship complies with the requirements of the provisions of SOLAS Chapter 11-2 and ISPS Code. Part of the responsibilities, such as audits and certification, may be delegated to the security-recognised organisations. 2. Company develops ship security plan through risk assessments and designates the company security officer and ship security officer for the smooth implementation of ship security plan. 3. 
The ship's security officer is responsible for the security of the ship, including the implementation of SSP in response to the security level set by the administration of flag state or the port state while the ship is in port. 4. The port facility security officer is responsible for the implementation of port facility security plan in response to the security level set by the administration. It may conclude declaration of security when required by the ship. 5. Port State Administration is entitled to request the information from ships prior to their entrance into the port. Port State is also entitled to control the ships and deny their entry to the port if necessary. SOLAS Chapter 12 is a new chapter for additional safety measures for bulk carriers. The slide introduces the backgrounds. Several bulk carriers, BCs, sunk during the late 1980s and the early 1990s. MV Derbyshire, flagged under UK, sank, killing all 42 aboard, on 11th July 1980. The incident is explained in this module of Part 4 on International Load Line Convention. On 1st July 1999, a new chapter was added as Additional Safety Measures for Bulk Carriers. On 1st July 2006, the chapter was totally revised by reflecting the result of investigation of MV Derbyshire. In SOLAS, two definitions of bulk carrier are provided. By Regulation 1.1 of Chapter 12, bulk carrier means a ship which is intended primarily to carry dry cargo in bulk, including such types as ore carriers and combination carriers. By Regulation 1.6 of Chapter 9, bulk carrier means a ship which is constructed generally with single deck, topside tanks and hopperside tanks in cargo spaces, and is intended primarily to carry dry cargo in bulk and includes such types as ore carriers and combination carriers. The illustration shows the difference between the definitions of Chapter 9 and Chapter 12. This indicates that the scope of the regulations for the bulk carrier was expanded and strengthened. Regulation 3 is implementation schedule for bulk carriers, which is coordinated according to the age of ships. This slide shows applicable requirements for bulk carriers. Regulation 4 is damage stability. Regulation 5 is structural strength, to withstand flooding of any one cargo hold to the water level outside the ship in that flooded condition in all loading and ballast conditions. In other words, the bulk carrier is capable of withstanding flooding of any one cargo hold in all loading and ballast conditions. Regulation 6 is structural and other requirements. Regulation 7 is survey and maintenance. As shown, these requirements are applied in accordance with the date on which the ship's keel is laid, the ship's length and density of the cargo. The requirements are enhanced with stringent criteria for damage stability, structural strength and cargo operations. Chapter 13, Verification of Compliance, is explained in Part 7 of the module as IMO Member States Audit Scheme. Chapter 14 is Safety Measures for Ships Operating in Polar Waters. This chapter and the International Code for Ships Operating in Polar Waters were developed in 2017 to supplement existing regulations of SOLAS and MARPOL Convention because polar waters impose additional navigational demands beyond those normally encountered and the polar ecosystems are vulnerable to human activities such as ship operation. The relationship between additional safety measures and the protection of the environment has been acknowledged as safety measures to reduce the probability of an accident will largely benefit the environment. Taking into account the limited time frame and the possibility of using this code by the administrations to which the participants belong, the course refrains from a detailed explanation of this code. Thank you for your kind attention. This concludes Part 2B of the module.